Well, all right. We're going to call the meeting to order. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record that this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. We are also uh, being recorded on Zoom. And for purposes of Zoom, we have tonight this evening joining us Mr. Walner. So all of our votes this evening will be roll call votes. So we'll, we're joined at the outset of this meeting by Mr. Walner um, virtually and Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez in person. And the uh, board states for the record that the meeting agenda contained the Zoom information on attending virtually and the number and the um, Zoom link. And if we could, if you could, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And our first order of business is the petition of Joe's Quickmart, a change of manager and doing business as. I'm going to recuse myself because the petitioner is represented by Attorney Barnowski, who I actually have at the present time uh, case, I represent uh, the city of Malden and Attorney Barnowski's firm is actually opposing counsel in the case. It's not a, nothing bad, it's a conciliatory <laughs> circumstance, but just to avoid any issue. I'll, I'll be turning the gavel over to Mrs. Gonzalez for that matter. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Joe's Quick Mart, change of manager in DBA. So who is here to represent? Hi, good evening. I'm Mr. Ward. My name is Adam Barnowski. I'm from Malden. I'm here to I do remember that coming forward with um, with the other site. So the new name is going to be Joe's Quick Mart. Yeah, that's correct. Instead of Speedway. Yes. Okay. Um, do any of the members have any questions? No questions, Mr. For the education of the board, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, the police department required additional time to complete the uh, background check, and I believe there was a report in there from the chief that the candidate meets the standard. Great. Everybody's okay with that? Okay. Everything sounds fine. Um, is this up for a vote? Yes. We have a motion. Madam Vice Chair, I move to approve the change of DBA for the retail. Package goods store wine and malt beverage license for Joe's Quick Marts, 
MALLC, 231 Main Street from Speedway to Joe's Quick Marts, number 514, subtotal regulatory department requirements. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Studo. We have a second by Mr. O'Leary. Um, Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Mr. Gonzalez says aye, and the chair recuses herself. Oh, we have another, and we have another motion. Madam Vice Chair, I move to approve a change of manager for the retail package goods store wine and malt beverage license for Joe's Quick Marts, MALLC, DBA Joe's Quick Mart, number 14, 514, 231 Main Street from Tyler Trendy to Ivarin Nervous Rivera. Second. Okay, I have a motion from Mr. Studo, a second from Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Ms. Gonzalez is aye, and the chair recuses herself. Okay, I think we're all set. Thank you very much. Congratulations, and best of luck to you, and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. You too. And I'll turn the <laughs> chair back all right. to you. Okay, our next order of business is recognition of two of North Reading's Eagle Scouts. We have here with us today um, Dan and Andrea Mills and their son, Kyle. And we have John and Michelle Barrett and their son, Max. So we welcome you and you, why don't you come up and tell us a little bit about what we, we heard about your projects, and then we're putting you on the spot, so don't worry about it. All you have to, well, I'd love it if you could introduce the rest of I know your brother, Sam. Yeah. I <coughs> also know your other brother, Nolan. But yeah, that's my brother, Sam. That's my, these are my grandparents, um, Lois Myers and Jim Myers. These are my parents. They're visiting oh. from Ohio. Oh, that's oh, wonderful. Welcome. Good welcome thing you're time. here. This is convenient. And um, Kyle, who else is with you? Uh, these are my parents, and that is my uh, grandmother. All right. Oh, nice. So we we heard about um, your ceremony, uh, your your ceremony to, when you were inducted as Eagle Scout. So we thought we don't want to let that occasion pass us by without acknowledging you from the board. Um, Leanne and Mrs. Gonzalez and I attended Christopher Nearing ceremony. It was really a wonderful yeah. ceremony and we think that it's there's such a small percentage of scouts that are able to make it to that level that we really are proud very proud of you on behalf of the board so we wanted to at least you know introduce you to the community acknowledge mm -hmm. your efforts um, it was a difficult thing to get through I'm sure during COVID and we wanted to just give you some recognition so if you don't mind sliding up to the microphone, telling us a little bit about the projects that you worked on to be able to um, to achieve the Eagle Scout. For sure. And Max, Max, you can go first, and then we'll call you up. Pat. Sure. So uh, my project was building shelving units for the uh, Union Congregational Church. Um, the goal was to so that the food pantry could um, move into the um, building on their property, mm -hmm. and so they needed to move all that stuff. It was, it was a storage building at the time, so they needed to move all that stuff in another shed so they could move the food pantry. So my project was to build shelving units in um, this storage shed so they could move the stuff from the new food pantry area over to the storage shed to expedite the process. That's great. And how long did that take you to complete? Um, from planning to completion, probably about uh, four months, three, four months. Good. So we have some pictures, I think, Mr. Gilberto, Sharon, of you obviously had help, right? Oh, yeah. You had the help, your dad's help. Dad's right that there. One. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And your father's an Eagle Scout too, right? He is, yes. Yeah. And um, who's in that picture? Uh, that's me on the left, and then uh, my good buddy Brandon DeClean on the right. Oh yeah, and he's an e he he's an Eagle Scout, right? He's not. Not yet, or is he? Uh, he did not. Yet. He did not make it. Okay. All right. So that's great. Does anybody have any questions? 
No? No questions, just no. comments. Yeah, same. Let's, <laughs> same. Just Let's comments. hear the comments. You yeah. want to, do we want to comment individually or do we? Why don't we comment collectively? Yeah, yeah. let's do that. Across the board the same. Yeah. yeah. And Kyle, do you want to come up to the mic and tell us what you yeah. what your project was? There is one. You can the sit up there. Right There's there. one right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my project was a um, flag retirement box, and it actually, it happens to be in the town hall. It's um, in the main lobby area. Um, the main goal of that project was to build a better um, box for people to put their uh, retired, or flags that um, are in need of retiring. Uh, the previous box was significantly smaller than the one that's here now. Um, and I think a lot of people didn't know where it was, so now it's in a more accessible place and it's easier to find. That's great. And it's a fine piece of furniture, too. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Are you looking for pictures, Mr. Gilberto? I, I have a picture, and for some reason it's not. <laughs> I, I have a question for Kyle. Can, yeah. you, can you recount what the Boy Scouts do with retired flags at camp outs like Sun Mountain? Um, yeah, so the, um, my Boy Scout Troop, uh, Troop 750 here in North Reading, um, they'll empty out the box and they go through like the whole ceremony of retiring them um, and they do them on scout trips or at troop meetings. It's a beautiful ceremony, I've seen it done, yeah, it's a great ceremony. Well, we're waiting for your picture, too. <laughs> but it'd be nice, parents, if you want to make any comments, too, you're here. Hmm. <laughs> what do you I'll, I'll give a, a little bit of an anecdote about the, the project itself. So it's not just the scouts and, and a couple of adult leaders who are kind of just overseeing, but the younger scouts come, too. So you got sixth graders and seventh graders who maybe have never touched a drill or worked. So during the project, Max had to make up a project for them and a highly value added piece of this was building floor platforms. So the, the younger scouts were building these floor platforms that went underneath the shelves and was able, so the underneath storage was able to be off the, off the floor in case the floor gets wet. So that's a cool little addition that happened and he and Brandon basically invented a makeshift platform and the, and the younger scouts were able to build those themselves. That's so. that's great. You know, the, the achievement to Eagle Scout, it takes so much effort to get there and we really did, we really do want to acknowledge you publicly, just like we were able to acknowledge Mr. Neary, because, you know, you really are our future leaders. You're learning all of these things that, you know, are somewhat lost to society and culture and things like that, and you're learning these sort of disciplined way to live and, you know, resilience and being able to to take the time to do a project like that that's community oriented, both of those are helpful to your community. And definitely the apple doesn't fall far from the tree for both of you and your family. So we really, we really just think it's important to let the community know you're out there. I think I read a stat that I talked about at Mr. Neary's ceremony where only 9% of, there's not that many scouts anymore and only 9% of the scouts achieve Eagle Scout. So it's really, it's really incredible. It's a real incredible testament to you and your families and all of the scouts mm -hmm. that are behind you supporting you because we, we actually heard a little bit about both of your projects at, at Mr. Nearing. So yeah. it was, uh, it's, we really are very proud of you as community members and we're, we look forward to seeing what contributions you're gonna have as leaders in the future. Hopefully it'll be for North Reading, but maybe it'll be beyond that. Maybe you'll be sitting up here. <laughs> or sitting somewhere else. So we're very, very proud of you, and we appreciate you coming in. It's something so important, but it's also something so positive to acknowledge what you've done. So we, we actually, well, I'm gonna, my colleagues are going to have comments, but I just want to read. We have certificates of recognition as well for both of you. It's just our... Certificates of Recognition from the Town of North Reading. We're honored to present the certificate as an expression of high regard to the both of you upon your attaining the rank of Eagle Scout 
as members of the Boy Scouts of America and to extend a personal thank you for the community service work you performed to achieve this honor. So congratulations to both of you. And so let, I'm just going to let's have some comments from colleagues. Mr. Walner? I'll just say I represent the 91% that didn't make a team. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it just shows a lot of perseverance from these two gentlemen, so it takes a lot, so. Yeah, thank you. Mr. O'Leary. First of all, congratulations for your achievement. Congratulations to your parents and all those around you that supported you, because again, I understand that it's not an easy task. I mean, choosing the project first and foremost, but then executing it only four months, you said. You know, you've got a piece of cabinetry here that you know you've got a bright future in cabinetry. Uh, honestly, it's beautiful. Uh, but you know, you said only four months. Well, it's not only four. That's that's a huge contribution and a huge commitment that you've made uh, to the community. And, and again, what you've done uh, in setting an example for others, but also in these tumultuous times, reminding us that uh, there's hope for the future. You know, yeah. I feel good about you two guys and what you've done for the community here. And uh, you know, you're our future, you're future leaders of the community, I hope in the community, but also other places. Um, but we're wishing nothing but the best and just you know, gratitude for your willingness to step forward and achieve your goal. Congratulations very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Studo. Uh, I'll echo Mr. O'Leary, I'll also say, I, I know, you don't want to join the select board. <laughs> uh, I do, so. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just went through the, I was never affiliated with it. I, I went to school with kids that did, but I just read in some of the requirements, and it's kind of amazing. It just shows uh, you need to be consistent. Um, that's something that uh, many lack. So that's very impressive. You need to stick with it. And it seems like you really can't take any time off from it if you want to hit the pinnacle of it. So it's not like I'm going to take you know a year off in between and then hopefully I make Eagle from the, my understanding of reading about it. So no, I, uh, I think it's great. I think that based on those percentages, I'm a math guy. I mean, having two in North Reading, it's pretty good. I mean, if we dial down great. even that, I mean, to have two out of a town as a small, probably the numbers are even more impressive. So. Oh, thank you, um, you know, and uh, I'm sure that unless something goes dramatically different for both of you, I just don't see how the success rate is not very high with a, a remarkable ceiling. So, thank you. Okay. Yes, Mrs. Gonzalez, first of all, I love that the generations are here, and it really shows to get this far, you do need your family support. Um, it's important, and you obviously have it. So that's just nice to see. Um, it's close to my heart. I was a Girl Scout. I was a Girl Scout leader. Brought my girls right through high school. Um, so I know the commitment it takes and the camaraderie that you get. Um, I, I know with, with my girls, they were personalities that would have never have been together. They would have never been together. So, and that brought them together and made them learn how to work with each other. and and befriend someone that they might, may not have befriended. So I, I just feel like scouting is just such an important thing. Um, it teaches so much, and congratulations to you because you went above and beyond and you know, ahead of everyone else. And congratulations for that, and I wish you all the best. And I'll just say, I, uh, my dad was a scout, and he didn't make it to Eagle Scout, but we, that's how we were raised with the Code of, the code of conduct and the Scouts Honor Pledge. So we grew up with all of that being instilled in us. So it's, it's far reaching what you're learning and who's, who you're surrounding yourself with. And I remember your brother because years ago when I first got on the board, Mrs. Magger asked me to speak at a, veteran, at a Veterans Day service and your brother spoke at the Veterans Day service. It was beautiful, but so well done. So 
it's nice to have you as members of the community, and it's nice to see what both of you are doing. Of course, we know your family as well, too, because your dad's on our finance committee. <laughs> <laughs> see your dad. Usually on too. Zoom, right? But <laughs> it's nice to have this kind of participation, but it's also nice to see what you're doing, we're, and, and we, we would like to see where you're going with it. And um, I think with that, we're going to maybe take a recess and take some pictures with you while you're all here, if that's okay. So we can mask up, if that's the best thing, and we'll just take pictures with masks this one time, all right? So. We're gonna do a brief recess, all right? And we'll do, how about Kyle? We'll, we'll have, we'll do one at a time, and then we'll get the both of you, because I think Maybe right here, Mr. Goldberg? Yeah, I think that might be correct. Right? Oh, I'll let you comment when we come back. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I know that's <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Well, I'm going to come to you to make it. Oh, and Rich, how are we going to Oh, well. Oh, can we stand in front of the, the there, there so he can come in? Can you? Yeah. And we can leave a spot. Why don't we put Kyle in the middle? Black football, Kyle will come in the middle and we'll do this, all right? How about that? Hold it. Okay. Are we want to have some seats over here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there he is. Well, we have a little space so we can see him. All right, Rich. You're on the big screen. You know, virtual meetings. Are we all in here? Can we see? Can we see Rich? Yeah. Definitely putting you on the spot. Yes. Would it be all right to get one with your family? Is that it? You want to do that? And if you're here, you're here. You might as well come in the phone. Why don't you get around your son? Dan and Andrew, get around. Dan, you know what I mean? Ethan, sure.
All right, so we're back from our brief recess. <laughs> what are the elite? And I forgot to go to Mr. Gilberto for comment. Mr. Gilberto, I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very briefly, for those of you who, most of you know I, I am an Eagle Scout myself, and I only offer that to tell you that I understand the work that you went through, particularly when it comes to pull, pulling off a project. I remember that feeling my sophomore, junior year of how on earth am I gonna, am I gonna do this? How am I gonna put together the hours that are required? How am I going to raise the money that's needed to do it as well? He still asks those questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, so uh, you, you saw where I was going there. <laughs> how am I going to coordinate all these people? Um, so um, it turned out to be uh, a great opportunity to learn some important lessons for what I do um, for our town today here. Um, so you know those lessons and, and that challenge that you just went through, um, it's in, or maybe, maybe not so recently went through now at this point, um, it's, in, uh, it's very important. And um, you know, I recognize and understand the work that you went through. I guess most importantly, thank you for everything that you've done for our community. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wow, I, uh, we just learned something new about the team. Yes, we did. Can, can we ask you what was your project? Um, you can. Uh, <laughs> Do you remember? Do you? I, you have to Do you have remember. a picture? <laughs> <laughs> these, these aren't make a birdhouse. These are pretty significant yeah. projects yes. that contribute to the community. Yeah. So in downtown Peabody, there is uh, Citizens for Adequate Housing runs uh, a uh, transitional shelter for um, single uh, women and their uh, children. And so there was a playground in need of some help, and we did some work to, to take care of that playground. That's great. Um, it, was a, it was a big project. Yeah, that's yeah, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Is it, is it still there? Um, so uh, that was quite a while ago <laughs> that that yeah. occurred, and if you know, I, I do yeah. think that they've uh, redeveloped. It was so now. long ago; it's now part of an urban renewal. Project. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of an urban renewal project. <laughs> so, so I don't believe so. <laughs> and there's actually a, a group for Eagle Scouts. In it's um, not a society. For an association. Yeah. An association, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. NESA. NESA. That you can connect up with other Eagle Scouts across the country, right? Yep. Yeah. It's just a great crew to be in. Great it's admirable. achievement, admirable achievement. Just like Mrs. Gonzalez said, we're really proud of you. On the behalf of the Barrettes, I want to say thank the select board for, for recognizing these scouts. It's a, it's a big deal. And uh, thank you very much for doing uh, what you did. I appreciate it. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. It is our pleasure. Thank you so much. You can stay for the tax classification here. <laughs> Good times. Some of, us, <laughs> some, of us, some of us don't even want to be here for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 actually, you probably could get an extra part Dan probably has to. Yeah. 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 Poor Dan. Yeah. All right, so thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Peace. Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. All right, um, we have our next order of business, which we're almost on time for, is the tax classification hearing. And I'm just gonna read the public notice into the record. The select board uh, notice of in-person and virtual public hearing on the property tax classification. The select board will hold a public hearing on Monday, November 22nd, 2021 at 8 p.m to determine the percentage of the local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property for fiscal year 2022 in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40, Section 56. This hearing is anticipated to be held in person in room 14 of Town Hall located at 235 North Street, North Reading, Massachusetts and via virtual technology and the publication of hearing includes the internet Zoom link and the phone numbers, the mobile phone numbers, dial by location numbers, meeting ID, etc. Interested taxpayers are encouraged to present oral testimony at this hearing or may submit information on their views in the writing to the select board, either via U.S. mail to, to the select board, 235 North Street, North Reading, Mass., or via email at townadministrator at northreadingmass.gov no later than 12 o'clock noon on Thursday, November 18, 2021 by the Select Board of North Reading 11-11-2021. Okay, so we're gonna open the public hearing 
And we are joined by our Deb Carboni. If you want to come up at the, to the table, we are joined by our finance director, too, Liz Rourke. And Mr. Gilbert, I don't know if you had anything to say to begin, or if we just want to go right to Ms. Ms. Carboni. Give you a Ma second there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, I, I, we have, uh, and you may or may not have seen, we have prepared the customary PowerPoint presentation uh, yes. with the addition of a new slide at the end that summarizes available uh, exemptions, two new slides at the end that summarize available exemptions for um, for the public. Uh, they are not a topic in terms of uh, action during the hearing this evening, but we obviously want to um, you know, let folks know that there is release that's out there. Um, and so that's at the end that's of the great. presentation. Just Madam right. Chair, before we start, may I make a comment, um, public statement that uh, I have a family member who owns commercial real estate as well as residential real estate in the town of North Reading whereby the uh, Board of Assessors are recommending a single tax rate. Uh, it does not pose a potential conflict of interest. If they were proposing a split tax rate, I would be recusing myself from uh, the discussion and vote on the matter. But since they are recommending a single tax rate, I will be participating. OK, thank you, so Mr. O'Leary. let the record show. Thank you. Sure. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to start off by saying, I'm glad we're back in person. <laughs> Last year trying yes. to do this by Zoom was really Interesting. difficult because there's there's sometimes questions and thank God we're back. That being said, I do want to just kind of update you guys. I really haven't seen you in, in a year or so, so I want to just update you on the assessing office and what will you been doing? So last 34 months, we've completed the entire um, reappraisal data conversion. We've also entailed a complete revaluation. When I say revaluation, the entire town is reevaluated from soup to nuts. Land, building, sheds, pools, you name it. We did get all that done. And we got it very timely on the new system. So, and I, I have to say, I was a little concerned going in to the rebound on a new system. But we worked really hard, and the Department of Revenue was really happy with our submitting of documentation for the rebound. This also came with. A retirement of um, one of our senior uh, administrators so that left just Paula and I to finish out all of this but we did get it done we kept our head to the ground and more importantly <coughs> the Department of Revenue was happy certification came in two weeks early so that's I just wanted to update you guys on what we've been doing for the last 34 months. That being said, we can move on to the classification hearing. I think we're going to call up your presentation on the screen. So just give us just give one second. Is it on the laptop? Is it on the laptop? Yep, I've got it right here. Okay. 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 I didn't know if I was staying true. No. There we go. I just, excuse me for one second, I did. I don't know why I did this, but I skipped over public comment. I think be, I think we can get back to that after this hearing, if that's okay. I because I didn't have my glasses on when I was looking at the agenda. <laughs> but my recommendation would be to come back to it after the hearing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's no time associated so, with it. Sorry. And also, this may generate more comment. I'm sorry. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry about that. But they can hang in there. All right. Okay. So we're here tonight for the fiscal 22 property tax classification. This is a hearing that must be held by the Board of Selectmen to cast three votes in order to submit our recap for a certified tax rate. The three votes that must be taken, one is for a minimum residential factor, selection of an open space discount in which we do not have any classified open space. We can talk about that. Granting of a residential exemption and granting of a commercial, a small commercial exemption. North Reading's pro, oh my, oh there it is. I looked and then I looked away. North Reading's levy profile as it looks today the residential percent of the values is still at 87.23%. The commercial percent is at 12.76. Which this year for fiscal 22, with the, with the revaluation completed, we have a levy of fifty-seven million two hundred and ten and eight dollars. What is a split or <coughs> dual tax rate? Communities that decide to tax residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property differently. Statute allows an increase in the CIP, commercial, industrial, personal property, share of the tax levy up to 50% higher than the residential value. This does not generate new revenue it reallocates the levy burden. The tax rate split for years in the history of North Reading is 1985 and 1988. As we see North Reading's residential profile today, we have 4,298 residential homes with an average single family value of 659,180. The residential condominium is increasing by 50 every year with the Pulte project. We're up to 907. The multi-families make up a total of 41 properties. That's your two families, your three families, your four, and um, Edgewood. The mixed use, that's like if there's an apartment on top of a store or commercial space, that equals 22. We have 197 residential vacant lots as of today. So the first thing we want to discuss is an open space discount. We do not have any classified, what they call classified open space in the town of North Reading. All of our property is taxed. It's either taxed at, at a agricultural farm, if it's a 7, 10, 12 acre parcel, then that's chapter property, what we call chapter property 61A. It's not open space. So we do not have any classified open space discount.
the residential exemption, the board may adopt an exemption of up to 20% to shift the residential class tax burden from the lower assessed properties that are the principal resident of a taxpayer to the higher assessed properties that are not the principal resident that are the not the principal resident of a taxpayer sorry the next slide is is the scenarios of what the shift would look like the middle of this 10% exemption scenario is the average single family home. I have used what the projected tax rate is going in for certification, that's $15. And what I did was I took a lower end and a higher end home. And if you look on the four, fifth line down the savings and cost so the savings of that eight hundred and thirty eight dollars and seventy seven cents would reduce the lower end home but would shift over to anything above the average value home are there any questions on that so what I did was I gave increments of five so there's a 10% a 15 and a 20 and it's the same methodology you can just see how the numbers change with the increase in the percentage Mr. <laughs> O'Leary yeah, quick question or comment sure the when you get the residential exemption, it primarily shifts to the commercial industrial. No, so the residential exemption, mm -hmm. it would take that percentage, say if the select board would wanted to adopt a 10%, it shifts on the residential class, or class one as we call it. So that wouldn't have a bearing on the commercial industrial, only the residential. So that savings on the lower end, lower end homes would shift over to the higher end homes. And then the commercial exemption would affect the, the commercial industrial and personal property. So that's, it's, it's separate. Thank you. I have a question too. Sure. So you're, the, me, the, medi the median is the middle, the middle range that you have up here. That's correct. The a home value of 559,000, assessed value that is. So uh, market value of 659, right? 659,180. And so that, so what you're saying is that's, you've defined that because of your whole, the whole evaluation of property as the median range. That's correct. So if we were to vote in this residential exemption the residential exemption would only apply to those those homes of that amount or lower of that assessed value or lower or higher so what right, happens the is it shifts higher. no but what i'm saying is the residential exemption would benefit the part the properties that are valued at that are assessed at 559 or lower and what that exemption calculates out to be is shifted on to those parcels that are above above exactly. that 559. Exactly. So it's not it doesn't benefit every resident. No. Of the uh, it's kind of a misnomer because you would think that the residential exemption would apply to all all res all residents who own their property. Right. And that's not <laughs> true. Right. I can give you a little bit of background on the exemption, the residential and commercial no. exemption. So I was going to ask you, has North Reading ever, my next question no. was, has North Reading ever, and if, if we did vote to enact this, because we talked a lot about this last year, we had a long discussion about it at last year's hearing, but if we voted to enact this, is that a permanent 
uh, change? So every year you would have the option to remove that? As I understand it, and I'm just going to put that little caveat in there. Traditionally, your, your smaller towns don't really look at this as a viable option. This was really created or, and or enacted by legislation for the city of Boston and for the properties down the Cape. So what they did was, as an example, the properties down the Cape, they would, the towns would vote for this because the homes that are the primary residence, they would save on it. But if it wasn't their residence and it was a second home, then they would pay the higher percent. So that shift was, was beneficial for cities and big vacation places, if you will. And I just have a, another quick question on this. Can you go back to the slide where you're showing, it was 40, 47, I think 4721 uh, single, oh, 4298, I was a little bit wrong. How many of the 4298 that you have here are under that market value or assessed value of six, the market value of 659 or assessed value of five? I can, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have that exact number right now with me. I didn't think to do that. I did run one for under 250 and we had five. So out of the 4298, I, I wouldn't even want to guess, but uh, you're probably looking at you. What about the 907 con residential condominiums? How many of Because those would be eligible for that exemption if they fell under the, the market, the six, your assessed value that you identified based on the median of 659. How many would be? So most of your condos outside of the greens, um, the greens are the only condo complex that exceed the 500,000 mark. Okay. So in other words, Pulte, we're at four, we're at 450, right around there. Um, and then our other small, like Greenbrier, those are averaging around 286 a unit. The Greens, you do have quite a few individual properties that are at 600,000 and up to eight, actually. Because <coughs> you have the freestanding units down there. Okay. So. But most of those condominiums sound like they would. JT, the J, the JT Bear, the Pulte, most of those sound like they would, would be, less. be eligible for this exemption. Yes. That would then be shifted on to the um, higher value mm -hmm. parcels. All right, I, thank you. I just wanted no to. Problem. Does anyone have any other questions on that? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Madam Chair, this just shows a 20% exemption, which was the third scenario. I think I still left off at the 15%. You see that, to be clear, the median is the $659,180. Is that correct, Ms. Carbone? Yes. Thank you. That carries across the, the average single family um, that is actually, I get to that number from the reporting I give to the Department of Revenue. So I just take all of my single family homes, the condos are in there, the vacant land, just the single family, and divide it by the number of single family that I have, the 4,298. And that gives me my 659,180. Just in case you want to know where that number comes, it's, it, and that's a number I give you guys every year. 
So that carries through no matter how much of an exemption, presidential exemption, you choose. It would still be that same middle point. That wouldn't change. Did someone? Okay. Mr. Mr. Studo. I have a question. Um, but it's a moving number, right? So meaning, It's a moving number. Meaning, every if year. you see the trend in North Reading, where I haven't seen a single family home built under seven figures since I pretty much moved here in 2017, that median keeps going up. That's correct. Right, so in effect, you know, you're, something like this eventually, if this keeps happening, you're gonna start giving tax breaks to people that are in some pretty expensive home if that median goes up. Like meaning if you ran this in Winchester, your median would be over a million and then you'd say, does somebody over a million really deserve an exemption? I'm just trying to get to that. So that's the other thing to take in mind that, you know, the more we build with these higher numbers is gonna keep shifting up. Like I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years that middle number is above seven. It wouldn't be shocking. I anticipate it being above seven or right at seven next year when I'm sitting here for this. Then we actually brought online nine new houses this year. We, we usually average between seven and nine. There was not one of the nine new houses that were below the Actually, most of them were right around the million mark. So, and they definitely take me a lot longer to measure these days. They're not just a little box anymore. <laughs> they used to be, but you, you know. Use the laser. I do use the laser, laser but sometimes you need the tape measure because the sun's out. It doesn't work so well with the sun. So no, most of the, the, the nine new houses that we brought online this year, they're 850 to a moment. Can I ask you a question to piggyback on that? Um, what do you anticipate for, from what you see based on some of the projects around town or however you pro forma it? Um, what do you see for a single family for next year, between like now and when you're sitting here a year from now? Can you like how many single families do you think will either come online or built? That's I'm what. anticipating around 11. Okay. All in that price range or above? Absolutely, absolutely. Even the teardowns that are happening, so Say a ranch goes on sale on Haverhill Street. That gets torn down and a, a $900,000 home is being built. Even when they're renovating, they're, they're adding the second floor, putting on a massive addition, and again, you're, you're looking at a value of $900,000. We send out what's called sales verification forms so in other words, when somebody buys a piece of property, we send them this form, and it's for our information to just track our market so that we know why our taxpayers are paying what they're paying for the property. A lot of cases, they, you know, they'll say the school systems, that is my number one answer. That is my number one answer. Second to that is, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll get a, a reply, you know, that interest rates are low, so I'll buy higher. It, you know, but they're willing to, to pay these $900,000, dollars for houses that, you know, 10 years ago or even five years ago were valued at six. The seller they never say it's because of the restaurants? Yeah, you know, I've never seen that answer. I look for it, though. I know we're not, I know, I know it, I know we're in the midst of the presentation and we're not exactly deliberating about this, even though it sounds like we're deliberating about it. But, Mr. O'Leary, I know you had a comment or a question, yeah, and I do too. Yeah, just a quick question in relation to home sales. You know, how does that genuinely affect or actually affect? the assessed valuation. You know, I've lived in my home for 34 years now. You know, I know what I paid for it, I know what I put into it, but I think it's worth now and what I'm assessed for, but 
house is found, I sell my house for $800,000, how do you assess it for the next owner? So I'll, I'll just recap a little bit. Um, that is a revaluation. We do update our values every single year. I'm a firm believer in that. I think you need to maintain that level of equity between your assessed value and the sale price. Uh, otherwise, what happens is you're, within the certification year, your values soar in your tax rate plummets. And that just causes inequities for taxpayers. Fast forward, how we get to the values annually, and, and please remember, we're always a year behind because we have to use 12 months of the inventory. So if I'm sitting here in November looking at sending in a tax rate recap for this week, I don't have 12 months. So we use the prior year sales. Those prior year sales are then depicted by location, such as a neighborhood. Haverhill Street is a different land price than Little Meadow. We also depict the values through the analysis for styles of homes by age and by size. It's, it's analyzed six ways to Sunday. I can tell you the, the sales are what dictates the values that we see. We only execute. So that being said, the sales are the dictator of the values. When you ask what else and how else you can get there, our cyclical cycle is a, it's worth its weight in gold. We go out, we remeasure, we relist these properties within that 10 year period. By doing that, we're maintaining the values of say someone puts on new deck but they didn't take out a permit, finished a basement but didn't take out a permit. We're trying to maintain that level of equity. We don't get in every house but we do, we have pretty good entrance rate. Yeah, but then, you know? back to my specific question. You know, so if, if I sold my house a year and a half ago for $650,000, would I be assessed for $650,000? So you would be assessed, you should be assessed right around within a 10% of that, absolutely. Unless, again, remember, I'm a year behind. So oh, no, you sold so it. Year and a half. Right. So that would be that would be the analysis for the year of the sales, and yet you should be within ten percent of that six fifty nine. Absolutely, all day long. Well said. I just have a I just have a thought that to me the. The residential exemption to me, as I understand it, and this is a great presentation with great answers, um, it doesn't seem to make sense to me if, unless, it, unless it's to be borne by, you know, non-resident or it doesn't seem to make sense to me because we have so many homeowners of that, you know, whatever, 4,700 or 4,900. 4900 that are that reside here. It seems predominantly like you know we have residents. It's not a second home or a vacation home yes. or a house that we're renting out to someone else as a commercial type of thing. So, but that was just my thought in terms of the the idea of this residential. We did talk at length about it last in last year's hearing, um, but. Is there, uh, do we have any, <laughs> and Mr. Gilberto, if, if Mr. Walner's raising his hand, I actually can't see him on the, so I don't wanna, if, just in case he has any question too, I, I just wanna make sure we're, 
I'll try to keep an eye on it. Paying attention. All right. I admittedly was not. Oh, poor Mr. So, Walner. So quiet, Mr. Walner. I know. That, he's as quiet virtually as he is in the, in the hearing. He wants to be out in the back deck with a pina colada. I'm saying this because I, I recall we had a lengthy discussion. Mr. Walner had a lot of discussion about this piece last year. That's what my recollection is. No. You got, are you all, Thank you very much. Are you all set? Okay. No other questions? Thank okay, you. that's great. Okay. No. All right, thank you. So now we'll move on to the small commercial exemption. The small commercial exemption works very similar as the residential exemption. What happens is the Department of Unemployment sends the, every assessing office within 351 communities a list of commercial property that is valued under a million dollars and has fewer than 10 employees. We physically go through this list to do the best due diligence that we can. The value, we don't have a problem, that's on our database. Sometimes with the uh, fewer than 10 employees, we may question that, so we'll do a little more digging and, and due diligence on that. As it stands right now on the small commercial exemption, there is only 67 properties that would even have potential of valuing this exemption. We have 85 industrial properties and 222 commercial properties. So out of both of those, there's only 67 that would qualify for this small exemption. And then that burden shifts over this to the shift. larger exactly. businesses. Does that Any include questions? office condos? Yep. yep. And what were the numbers it again? It does. And what were the numbers again that we have? So 222 commercial, and we have 85, 85 um, industrial. Now, I didn't include the personal property because personal property doesn't work on this exemption. Does anybody have any questions on? That's it. As, as we're almost wrapping up the, um, the hearing, the select board does have the option to shift the tax burden from the commercial, industrial, and personal property classes as long as the shift does not exceed the minimum residential factor of 87.24. This means that no more than 12.76% of the residential burden can be shifted to the commercial, industrial, and personal property classes. The following pages contain the information of the impact of any shift of the tax burden that you may choose. The Board of Assessors, as of this hearing, recommend a factor or a tax, single tax rate. And I'm usually asked to give our opinion, so that's why I have it in there. So this pie is just a, ch a chart to show you how much the residential, commercial, industrial, and personal property. Mr. Studo. Um, at what point, because we're, you're probably aware that we're having discussions about wastewater and sewer and how that will dramatically change what you do. It, it, it should, that, that's part of the point. Um, because of the change is high, right? Maybe it doesn't look like this in 10 years. At what, you know, if you have it, at what number do you see communities, you know, what percentage has to be 
commercial industrial before a split makes sense, before you shift more, if there is? So there really is no rule of thumb. I can tell you, and I'm outdating my, my time in this industry, back in the 1980s, the late 80s, before they, before they actually decided that towns could split before this magic 30%, which used to be our rule of thumb that we would go by. Um, but so that certain municipalities that did have, say, 22 or 26% with the commercial, industrial, and personal property together, then the piece of pie would work to that 30%, and then a shift was at that time accepted and or voted in. Now, since 1988, they, the legislation changed that as long as your minimum residential factor is below a certain amount, you do have the right to shift up to. And that's why they say up to, because you don't have to shift, you know, to the 1.5%. You can shift up to 10% or 20 or whatever. So, and that minimum residential factor, so if this pie was shown, let's just say, residential at 80, is that where that 20 gets calculated? Exactly. Okay, and then, um, okay. And then also, this is like a little yes. different, but then you have to factor in competitiveness if you shift it. Or does that even get factored in when you look I, at it? I think if we go to the next slide, it'll probably yeah. make a little more sense. We have one because you're talking I, about you're talking about two different things. I, so. I have a feeling you're talking about the residential exemption. So the residential no, exemption. No, no, no. I'm talking right. about the split. The Ta split like tax. Meaning rate, at what yeah. point? Okay. Because we're having like at what point in Debbie's opinion do we get to the point where it's like realistic where we should look at the split right. tax rate? Okay. So Mike, can you go two slides over? We can jump out of order a little bit here. Oh, that's kind of hard to read. <laughs> Do you want to see it on paper? I did bring it. No, I, I have it here and okay. I can pull it up. So this scenario, and I've I've given you from 2017 to 2020, which includes your tax rate. It includes the lower, the average, and then the higher. So if you look at this, the residential is up top and the commercial is down below. So if you were to shift the saving, the looking for savings on the residential, you're, you're not really going to achieve it from, from them okay. at this time, in my opinion. And that's, that's what you asked, in my opinion. Yeah, the question is, because I know at this time it doesn't make sense. It's almost, I know it's hard to project, but at what, yeah. at what point? So you're... This is straight up. Right when you have more, so that's what like, right. just, we, we just need more. We just don't have enough. Well, let's get through the if, presentation, then we can deliberate about it. Because I know you're asking questions, but we also we, we may have public comment on that. And then we as a board can, well, you're going to, Mrs. Carbone's going to stay with us. But I'll, also, there's a, is, is everything OK? Oh, is everything all right? No cheating. I know Mr. Oler has identified it. It's okay. It's, it's not significant. Right. It may not be material. So, because why don't we let Mrs. Carbone get through the presentation, hold the questions if we can, because we're, I think we're, we're stumping the poor assessor to telling us something <laughs> that has a really a myriad of circumstances that have to factor in. But her simple answer, I think, Mr. Suda, was not right now. Oh, no, no. I, I, <laughs> because I, you're going to basically right shift from 87% of your taxpayers onto what? 12.76. They're going to, 
that that's going to be an I, immense yeah. burden. I, I didn't suggest right now. But yeah. I no. Right. Point. When? Yeah. And I did hear. Well, we can we can talk about. He has a about, vision. We, we can, There's a vision. We, I think that really we 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 have to we have to be visionaries in that aspect. Yeah. For as as long as we're here, but other communities uh, which have smaller percentages, their <laughs> select boards consistently shift and increase the burden onto the businesses of the community which are a slim sliver of the tax taxpayers in the community such as Reading and that now if it gets borne by small businesses or businesses that sent it's it's just they're gonna go to another community. They're gonna go to a different community because they can't afford the continuing increase Increased burden upon them when there's not nice. a lot of businesses in there in the first and place. And if you're trying to draw businesses to the community, looking at the sewer and, yeah. and wastewater and stuff like that, you, know, you really kind of have to take that all as a whole and, and process what makes sense mm -hmm. for today. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow could be a whole different scenario. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Mike, could I ask you to go back one slide, please? Thank you. So this shifting of the rate is the example if you went 10%, if you went 25, or if you went to the full, or the max, as we call it, to the 1.5. And you can see the differences in the tax rate in where it lands and it, it's just a 10 percent 25 and 50 percent it does not generate new revenue it only shifts it okay any questions on that or comments on that from the my colleagues okay all set we're do you have any other slides on that I know you, rec you recommended a single tax rate for us. Are you making any recommendations with respect to residential exemption? None. Um, and does anyone have questions about the shifting, the scenarios that Ms. Carbone has out, out there? Was that your last slide? Um, we just have the conclusion. All right, let's hear that. <laughs> oh, oh, my. I can just read. It's only three bullets. We, simple. we have it here anyway. Well, exactly. Mike, Mr. Gilberto's trying to do that for those joining us. Oh, on, that's right. Online. But that's okay. Why don't you just right. read it to us? Sure. So the conclusion is we must set a tax Once, rate. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Do you want to take a brief recess, Mr. Uh, for, more for the record, the public participating via Zoom can see this. I don't know whether more cameras viewers can see it, though. They cannot. They cannot see it. Though. We're directly so if you could read the slide. Sure. To you, Madam Chair. Yes, please. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No problem. So in conclusion, we must set a tax rate and mail tax bills before December 31st. The options before the select board retain a single rate tax rate in FY22, split the rate in FY22. Do you want to adopt a residential exemption? And do you want to adopt a commercial exemption? A small commercial exemption, sorry. Thank you. Okay, let me just, before we go to, there it is, okay. Before we go to any attendees' comments, do my colleagues have any other questions? Questions? All right. And we'll go to open the, at this point, open the hearing to anybody. We don't have anyone in person, but anyone attending virtually or by phone, if there are any questions, if you could come forward, state your name and address for the record and provide your comment. And 
Do you have any? You could just raise your hand or in the chat room. Seeing none, we'll close that portion. And Mr. Gilberto. Sorry, Madam Chair, for the record, uh, we did set a deadline of today for any written comment via uh, the mail or via email, and uh, we did not receive any written comment. Yes, in the paper it said November 18th, though. Was that today or the 18th? That would have been Thursday. All right. Um, let's discuss this to my colleagues. Uh, anybody have any? Now we're going to close that, close that portion of the hearing. Hearing no comment, and to my colleagues, we'll turn it over to discuss. Any comments? Any questions? Any thoughts? What's good? What? <laughs> I agree with the recommendation, agree with the recommendation. for the single. Uh, All right, we have to do it one at a time, Mr. Studo. I agree with the recommendation for the single uh, rate and uh, to not uh, pursue any kind of residential exemption at this time. Mrs. Gonzalez. The same. Okay. Mr. O'Leary. I, I just think for public's information, uh, an average family home, which is now assessed at 659, 180. If you do the full classification, are you talking just the residential now or are you talking the whole follow by whole presentation here? You, we're talking all of it. Okay, the whole thing. Yes. So, so and then these two, the, our two colleagues have given their thought on it. Right, so. but I, I just think it's important for the public to understand, you know, really what, what the shift means for the average residential property assessed value and the average commercial. Right, so the average residential is assessed at 659, 180. Average commercial is one million two nineteen one sixty six. So if we're going to shift the burden, we can shift up to one hundred fifty percent. It means a savings of nine hundred eighty eight dollars for the average residential, and an increase of eighteen hundred twenty nine dollars to the commercial industrial. But keep in mind, it's you know less than ten percent of the eleven percent of the property value loans. So you know we can save the tax average taxpayer by shifting it, the total one hundred fifty percent. You know eighty two dollars a month but cost the small number of commercial properties over $152 a month, and that's just on the average average property valuations of those two entities. So uh, to me, we're not there yet. So I think the recommendation by the Board of Assessors is wise, and mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, uh, anything else, Mr. O'Leary? No, nope, thank you. Mr. Walner, your thoughts? Yep. Uh, yeah, no, I think we're staying the course until we have some other infrastructure changes that justify it, we're staying the course for this year. Thank you, Mr. Walmer. Now, I would, from the chair, I would agree. I think it's it's incredibly harmful to shift the burden like that onto the limited number of businesses that we have, particularly because people are catching their breath and getting on their feet, back on their feet from all of the issues with COVID and I know that we factored that in last year but we also we also we do want to continue our mission to attract businesses that's a whole EDC goal and I don't think we would be achieving that goal if we if we suddenly now implemented the you know shifting of the bird and I also you know and again I'm using Reading as an example they might have, you know, Walker's Brook Drive and a, a, a bunch of larger name businesses and growing, growing their business industry, but it's the smaller businesses that suffer when the burden continues to be placed higher and higher and higher upon the smaller businesses. So you're essentially eliminating those and, we, and the smaller businesses are, I think, a large part of North Reading's identity, and we want to do whatever we can to kind of keep them in place. And we've seen a lot of changes as a board over the past year. Businesses that are shifting owners that have been around for a long, long time that, you know, businesses that had to close, but even with the help that they were given, businesses that had to close or downsize tremendously due to, due to COVID. So um, I'm in full agreement with my colleagues, and thank you so much for that presentation. All right, so do we have, would do, of where, if there's nothing else, if we can have, most, Mr. Gilberto, anything else you want to add to that? Nope. All right. Mr. 
two though, do we have? Madam Chair. We'll have multiple motions, I think. I move to establish tax tax classification factor of one as recommended by the Board of Assessors. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Chair and Manny Pelli is aye. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to recommend to the Board of Assessors that the FY 2022 tax rate be set at $15 per 1,000 evaluation. I skip one, I'll go back. You skip two. That's all right, you can go back. Yes. You can, we can move around now, that works. Yeah, I saw the choice, okay. I, I, I messed up the line. Motion by Mr. Studo to set the, the tax classification as recommended. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move not to establish a commercial exemption. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to recommend the FY 2022 property tax levy at $57,210,008.40, which is $11,710.60 less than the levy limit. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. All set? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, Mr. We didn't do the commercial exemption. No. We did, didn't we? Not to establish. No, we oh, did it's not the, the same residential. as. Oh, no. I thought we voted. No, I said I. Commercial. The, the same. I have two of the same then. No. We yeah, I definitely said not to establish a commercial exemption. You said commercial. It is there twice. It is there twice. That's right. So we it's wanted. It's there twice. Okay, so the other one's residential or just amended? You did a residential and then you voted a commercial right after. From what I see in order. Right. Do you oh, not show that? Did I miss the commercial? It was right after the residential. Right after oh, the residential. Oh, I have it on the, on the motions. I, I didn't hear it. Okay. Yeah, no, no, that was me. I didn't do the residential. I have the commercial here twice. That's what confused me. Should, do you want to revoke the residential, Mr. Gilbert? I never voted the residential. I just have the commercial listed twice. That's what do you want to make a motion, Mr. Yes, I do. I would love to make a motion. <laughs> so you were right. Madam Chair, uh, I move not to establish a residential exemption. Second. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Studo, second this. by Mr. O'Leary. Hearing any, seeing any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gensel. Aye. Those are the same thing. Menu Pelly is aye. Yes. Okay, okay now we did them all. We voted all of them. All right. Anyway. I just know uh, we get asked. We want we want the rate certified. Yeah. Still more. Yeah. What I'm really I'm doing. I'm uh, checking. You know, That's why you're really so good at what you do. I'm trying to really screw up with this clerk job, so don't ask me to do it again next year. <laughs> so, oh, I see. There's a plan. Well, yeah, this guy gets it all wrong. Imagine right. how good you get it <laughs> next year. We want you to get it right. No. We want you um, to keep doing it until no. you get it right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> so we are Mr. Gilberto. M Madam Chair, through you, I do want to just recognize that the assessor has prepared a very brief couple of slides for the public just to know what exemptions are available yes. to them. That's great. And I know that's not customarily part of a classification hearing, but I thought that maybe we could just briefly go over that. There's no action that's required at this point in time um, on them. But yes. That'd be great. Can you call those I, up? Pull those up yes. That is typically something we do talk about during this hearing. So cool. we make use of your time <laughs> on that. All right. Three, 
Madam Chair, to the assessment. Okay, we will begin. I'm going to start with the uh, veterans exemptions. Actually, I'm going to back up and, and let you let the public know that these exemptions do exist. So through the assessing office, we have the application. We also have a little cheat sheet um, because a lot of the exemptions have different qualifications. Those qualifications are, are created by legislation, not by our office. We go on the internet every single year and look at what's called an IGR, which is an informational guideline release, because if there's any change from the DLS, Department of Law, then it would be on the IGR. So we make sure that we have the most updated information. I also want to let um, the select board and the public know, as of today when I went on to mass.gov, we have in the town of North Reading accepted chapter 59, section five, which allows our office to increase our exemptions to whatever the COLA is that year. So we increase our exempted amount that we're abating off of the tax bills by the COLA, which is set by the state, not set by us, our federal election. That was the recent thing that we adopt when we adopted that, that that um, that we were we were wondering, we were talking about this I'm wondering. Yeah, well, that's not we, we as a group, but we were questioning so the we, TA on that earlier. That was we, a recent change that to the legislation, right? Three years no, ago? No, no, we We've oh, okay. been increasing by the COLA. I know for the 11, 12 years that I've been here. Okay. Um, and most communities do. I'll be honest with you. I can't remember the year that it was available for municipalities to adopt. I, I honestly can't remember. But I want to say it was a good 18, probably 18, 20 years ago. So, and what that does, it tries to keep up with the inflation in whatever minimal way. Um, the exemptions, this first slide for Clause 22, Clause 22 is for a veteran. The veteran under Clause 22 would receive a letter from the Veterans Administration in Boston stating that they have 10% um, disability. At that point, they fill out the application, they bring it in, and the Board of Assessors signs it, and $400 is removed from their third and fourth quarter bills. Your third and fourth quarter bills, third is the payment in February, and your fourth is the May bill. Those are the only two um, quarters that the assessing office can by statute abate any monies off of. So for 22A, which is the next exemption, that's $750. And again, you would receive a letter from the, from the Veterans Administration for all of these statutes that I have listed here. Those the VA faithfully sends those out. They're usually by the end of June. And I can tell you all of our veterans that do come in every year, they have their letter. They know that they need them. Um, there are, so there are a few that the disabilities are, are more than just a percentage. We do have a Clause 22D. The Clause 22D is for surviving spouses that have never been married. And that's 100%. 100% of their tax bill is physically abated. Um, 22F, I can tell you, we 
item that we have won. Um, and that is certified by the Veterans Administration and the veteran must be a paraplegic and that's 100% exempted also for the If anyone, any of the taxpayers out there have any questions on these exemptions, by all means, call our office. We can mail you an application. We can mail you a copy of our cheat sheet. We're willing to discuss um, whatever questions you may have. So then we'll move on can to I just have a, a, a question on the, on the veterans, uh, Madam Chair. It, it's my understanding that the, the, the town may have an opportunity to increase these exemptions for veterans, but there's some machinations we have to go through in order to do that. What do we have to do? and what is the limit uh, that's available to us to increase, increase these exemptions. You know, well, well, we may have made some adjustments for cost of living. These things haven't changed in decades. Um, so what do we, what can we do? Can I answer? Of course, oh. yes. I'm if asking you, you through if her. If you can, <laughs> yes, yes, Mrs. Yes. So traditionally, we do, we do increase by the COLA every year. So the percentages. So excuse me, just, just in relation to that. So the four hundred dollars. What was it last year? Off the top of my head. So the right. twenty-two. No, the twenty-two is always four hundred. Okay, so that's so not, the, that's oh, not cool. I, I, hold on, I'm sorry, I misspoke on that one. The cola goes over to the other exemptions, not on the veterans. Not on the veterans. Sure. That's I'm sorry, I missed. Right. That was my understanding. The four hundred dollars yes. has been the yes. same for the veterans are veterans. whatever the legislation has. When there's a change available for municipality to adopt, it's local adoption. So we would have to go to town meeting. I will look into it. Um, and see what's available. I did jump on mass.gov today real quick. I did not see a change. Mike did send me the, um, the article, but I did not get a chance to look at it before coming to the meeting tonight. I apologize. It's my, so, to my colleagues, it's my understanding that you know, some municipalities have been able to uh, take advantage of change in legislation, which has nearly doubled uh, the veterans exemption oh, wow. $400 to $800. Uh, again, to me, this hasn't been addressed in yeah. decades, other than the legislation has allowed municipalities to take advantage of it. Uh, I think if there's an opportunity for us to do it, I think we should strongly consider it. Absolutely. And if it takes town meeting action, we should be prepared to do it at the next town meeting. Absolutely. Um, it's the same thing with all the rest of the clauses here, 22A, 22B, C, D, yeah. whatever, whatever it is. But I think uh, if you could put together some sort of presentation to us as to uh, what's available to us um, and what we could, should be or could be proposing uh, for consideration for town meeting, if that's what it's going to take. You know, I know if there's a, we, we have an open town meeting form of government here, so it's different than a, a city council or board of aldermen or something who may be able to address these things just amongst themselves. Uh, so we may have one extra hurdle to go through, but that's okay. I think uh, it should be initiated to the board and uh, should be considered by the public as soon as possible. Yes. If, if there's whatever I find, we our office would have it ready for the annual zoning uh, without a doubt. We could definitely have it. If it requires local adoption, we would have to wait till the annual town. So I would definitely have that ready by here. If it's not local adoption, then we'll get it ready and it will be before the board prior to, as soon as the tax bills get Perfect. Thank you. All right. Okay. So can we just re quickly do a review because it's the hour is getting late. So can we quickly review also the other exemptions that you have listed here? Sure. So the other exemptions pertain to, well, we have a 17E, which is surviving spouse with a minor child. 
Um, there again, that's a percentage. It's, a, it's an income asset. The asset never includes the primary domicile or their house. Um, the amounts are, again, set by the state. The Clause 37A, that is illegally blind. Um, we do have a couple, um, I'm thinking we have two applicants currently, and they would receive a certificate from the Massachusetts Commission of the Blind out of Boston. And that exemption amount is 500. The 41D is for, for uh, taxpayers that are over 65. That is an income asset. Um, as you can see, these income and assets, um, the income is, is considerably low in my opinion um, and that is that is a place that I I know we can change that by local adoption um, and it, you're right it probably is um, again the assets do not include the primary domicile Mr. Studo question um, yeah for, well, two questions. One, what is the percentage of the exemption? It doesn't show here. If you qualify for this, what is it? Like, what do you get? Like, the other ones show exactly what you get, either the dollar yeah. figure or percentage. Seven, 750, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm wrong, I'll, I'll let you yeah, know. 750 plus COLA. And then another question. When it comes to calculating the income, because the state and federal government use very different equations. Do they take into account federal, state, pensions, and social security as income yes. in the equation? They do, so it's not, so it's all income. They don't exempt up, because you know how certain calculations for benefits, like if you have a federal pension, you can make 100,000 and they won't count it. Correct. For, so this considers this everything. This considers okay. it an asset. Okay. So in the last um, clause that's available is a 41A, and that's a tax deferral. They, the applicant must be 65, and they can defer up to 100% um, of their taxes. What happens is the treasurer would put a lien on the property, and at time of sale, dissolving ownership for about finding a way to say it, um, that lien would be paid off so, at the time. So that would be at the time of death or whatever. Well, that's what, yeah. But I, it would be a full, like meaning whoever the beneficiary or the estate would That's be. correct. Like they couldn't, they wouldn't account. have the right to defer on. Well, they wouldn't have to make due and payment on yes, the, but they on wouldn't the, continue the deferral of no, the previous no. one. It's on the current taxpayer that has taken out the deferral and signed for that one. Okay. Thank you. Mr. O'Leary? Just in relation to Clause 41D, again, if we have some local option to change those income levels, if you look at, you know, for a single person living in a home, yeah. you know, Income can't exceed twenty-two thousand dollars. The average family home right now right. tax bill is going to be ninety-eight hundred eighty-seven dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously these haven't been adjusted for inflation or at all. Uh, so so if we have that opportunity, we should avail ourselves of that. Since you know, as far as nineteen fifty-four, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> and as far as the forty-one A tax deferral, one of the other important considerations for people is you know the interest rate that municipalities must charge on the deferral. And I believe it's around four or five percent, which is sig significant. You know, so that when people enter into these agreements with the community, you know, if you're gonna do it for ten years and you're deferring hundred percent of your taxes, you know, it's nine thousand bucks and it's ninety thousand dollars plus interest over a ten year period. So it's significant. So if there's something that can be done in relation to interest rates that we charge, um, 
I think that's important to check it in. So I, I think it's important for the board to understand what our options really are in relation to uh, local acceptance of certain statutes and how we can adjust those. Uh, the, the other thing that we don't have here in North Reading that other communities such as our neighboring one in, uh, in Reading has done is that they have a, uh, well the state has a circuit breaker bill, you know, for senior right. citizens with certain income levels and when the ratio of the income level to the uh, exceeds 10% of the, the real estate taxes exceed 10% of the income level, uh, they get up to $1,150 this past season tax season off uh, of their tax. They get an actual credit of $1,150 to help offset the cost of their real estate taxes. Reading has incorporated in their exemptions the opportunity to match it. Uh, if you've lived in your residence for 10 years, you meet the certain income limits and you qualified under the, the state, uh, they, they can, you can get up to the same amount. So I think we need to take a look at that too because again, we have a significant uh, number of people within our population here who are, are trying to age in place. You know, and, and they maybe have been retired for a number of years, 15 years, 10 or 15 years, and all of a sudden, I mean, if you look back as to what your tax bill, and most of us have been here for a long period of time, if you look back 10 years as to what your tax bill was 10 years ago as opposed to what it is today, yes, your assessed valuation has gone up, but you know, maybe your income hasn't. Uh, so we have a lot of people who want to age in place. Uh, if we can, again, avail ourselves of an opportunity as to what our neighboring community has done and tie it to the circuit breaker, I think that's something also that this board should consider. Again, whatever machinations we have to go through, whether it be town meeting or whether we can do it unilaterally here, uh, those opportunities should be presented to us to consider, and I think we should be. So if you could take a look at that too, that would be terrific. Could I, could I oh, yes, of course. So the way the uh, abatement exemptions work, some of them are reimbursed by the state. In other words, we send in what's called an MD-1 in the month of April at the end of accepting and abating all of the applications, qualified, qualified applications. For the means test and the additional 1100 that Reading does, they do receive their reimbursement on the initial abated amount, but the match, we, they're not reimbursed for that additional amount. So say they abated, uh, uh, hypothetically, they have this property, they abated $700. $700 they, the town of Reading matched that $700. So the total abatement was $1,400. That $700 that was matched by Reading, that the town has to raise that amount of money. Mm -hmm. So the only reason I'm saying that is we, with budgetary constraints, we need to be cognizant of the fact of if whatever additional monies that we're going to expect on abatements and or exemptions, we need to raise that in the overlay. Yep. So just, I just didn't want to, you know, leave and, and not have everyone understand that that, that is where they do come out of. I fully understand that, you know, we still need same number, raise the same number of dollars in order to operate. Mm -hmm. you know, but by the same token, for the people that we're uh, looking to target here, these are the people we want to have stay in our community. Mm -hmm. These are the people that don't have children in the school system. You know, so as soon as that three bedroom ranch is sold from someone who's been living here for 43 years, you know, and you now fill it with, with someone with two or three kids, uh, that becomes a loser. I want these people to stay, I want them to age in place, I want them to be comfortable in their home, and if it costs us $750 or $1,500 a year, it's a win. It's a huge win. And uh, I, think, I think the board just needs to be presented with those opportunities. Absolutely. And I will get that data. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, just I'm just saying the data, like, I mean, I could probably get exactly of, uh, like you said, like, how many households are you talking about qualified? 
I I wouldn't know that number. We're talking age. Can we get the income number? Because that that's an easier way to like I'm just saying we can I think it's a a good cause to try to do it, but knowing the number of households that we would need to find money on the other side would be important. Like do we have that data of how many households were qualified? If we raise I, it, let's say to fifty thousand? Because I think that would have to be part of the presentation. Like, I, I, it'd be hard to make a decision to say, okay, if we raise it to 50, we don't know how many people will qualify, right? Do we have access to, we have access to income data, right? I personally don't. But does the um, I could ponder the thought on how I can obtain it. I, I can offer you maybe a quick shortcut. The Massachusetts Department of Revenue knows how many people the town of already qualified for the circuit breaker. Okay. This is your maximum. If they need to go to tie to the circuit breaker. You, but you're, you're talking about an increase to those income limits, though. Well, I can tell you right now, the circuit breaker income limit far exceeds what we have here for $22,000. Far exceeds. It's like $65,000. Uh, yeah, well, I think we need more data. No, but in our, the Department yeah. of Revenue, you can tell you yeah. how many people filed for income tax return. Right. Our colleagues in Reading have gone for overrides to be able to but, but qualify you know, pay for, for their operation. Qualify for the circuit breaking. So that that never yeah. has to be quantified. But if it's a big it's a it's a we we would we really would need the data to be able to Right. So I'm just asking that we get it. To make a yes. Yeah. Informed to make a decision. informed decision on what we would present to town meeting on that. All right. Mr. Walner, do you have any Questions, comments, or thoughts? Mr. Walner is also our age, age friendly guru. Yeah, so um, I will comment just that uh, we did talk about this clause 41D last year. The comments that Steve O'Leary said today are the same we talked about last year. There's practically nobody that qualifies for it. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a benefit with no applicants because nobody really qualifies to live in town with those circumstances. Right. Um, so I am the liaison for the tax aid committee. Um, we've had a few meetings. We recognize there's many shortcomings, and it would take a commitment of the town, but we don't have good data, and that, that is what we need to get to come back to the town with what's realistic. And then I didn't know about the Reading uh, uh, circuit breaker thing. So we also, it's obvious now that I'm listening to this, that we need to work on best practices to what other other towns have already done that we haven't done yet to try to get closer to the mark. So this needs a lot of work. I, this is, I, I've, been, I've known this category needs a lot of work. I haven't focused on the age-friendly other side of it, but this is definitely one of the objectives we have to focus on. And Debbie knows this as well as me. So um, something we have to work on. We haven't, again, a few meetings in, we'll just realize our shortcomings. We don't have any great answers at this point. So we'll work on it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walner. Okay, well, I think is that concludes the presentation. That's great. Thank, thank you so you. much for your thank you. information. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. And it was great to see everybody. I can't say it enough. <laughs> Glad to In be person. back to normal. <laughs> oh, right. almost, right? Oh, well, yeah, we're good. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's do, uh, let's go backwards Public now to yeah, the <laughs> public comment, uh, which we skipped over. Is there, any, is there anyone here that wishes to speak in public comment? There's no one personally present, so anyone who is joining us virtually, someone has a hand raised. Mr. Greenberg? Uh, no, that's the cursor right there. Oh, that's, okay. Okay. that's the cursor. <laughs> that's the cursor <laughs> in, uh, that in here. <laughs> All right, so I see I see none, so let's move on to, we're going to table the vote to ratify the uh, North Reading Staff Memorandum of Agreement, um, and we're going to move on to legal, legal bills. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for September 2021 in the amount of 9,375.62 as follows. General 689512, Labor 133250, 20 Elm 1148, total 937562. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manupelli is aye. Evans. 
Next order of business is the minutes. June 21st, 2021, regular and executive session. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 21, 2021 regular session minutes as written. Second, Mr. Chair, did you Michael? I did, Madam Chair, through you. Uh, Madam Chair, and I know it's upcoming, but there were a couple of minutes where we had missed a couple of corrections that were more Scrivener, I think, in nature than anything else. We made those corrections and we uploaded those minutes into the folder during the course of the day today. They were in a separate PDF. Um, they okay. were. They, they are marked up accordingly, but they were. I think they were all scrivener's errors. So on our motion as amended, or do we want to table uh, no, that? Think, to the I don't think that was for these minutes. I think it was for the next one. As I'm, oh, I'm jumping okay. ahead. Are you sure it wasn't for these? <laughs> We've okay. tabled these seven times. I mean, it's June. Okay, so we we we're uh, still second. Yeah. We're <laughs> moving to moving to approve the minutes as amended. Mo Mr. Studo, did you make the motion to move to approve as amended? No, I thought those were the next ones he said. No, they had these ones as well. Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 21st, 2021 regular session minutes as amended. Second. Okay. Motion, <laughs> motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walder. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Daniel Pelli is aye. Are the next ones as well uh, amend, as amended? Yes, Madam executive Chair. session, yes. Madam Chair, through you. So all of these minutes as are, amended. All, they're, they're all revised. So we did that between the last time these were on the agenda and tonight. Then today, there were further corrections that were made, which is what I was speaking to. Do you want me to say as revised and then amended? As for the, amended. For the, for the, I think as amended will do it, but I just want to be clear that two things happened. We made corrections between the last meeting and today, and then there were a few other things we had call? to do additionally. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to approve the June 21st, 2021 executive session minutes as amended. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the October 18, 2021 regular session minutes as amended. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the October 18th, 2021 executive session minutes as amended. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. S Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Kelly is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the November 1st, 2021 regular session minutes as amended. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to approve the November 1st, 2021 executive session minutes as written. Second. Doesn't matter, right. Second. As written as or, amended, or as, as amended, amended. Sorry, you as did amended. say as written. I, I, my apologies. As, 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 as amended. amended. Look at that. So <laughs> <Motion>. <laughs> I heard amended. <laughs> Obviously, you need more practice. You get another year close. Another year. You just don't. You just bought it. Mr. Wall is giving the thumbs up there. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is aye. All right. We're all set with the minutes, and now we're going to move on to the review the upcoming board's meeting schedule. So, Mr. Gilberto. We're in, we already have meetings set, and we're December 6th. Yes, 
Would, would you like me to review? Yes. Through you, Madam Chair. Yes, we have meetings set for December 6th and December 20th. Those are our regular meetings in the month of December. Uh, we scheduled to continue our strategic planning meeting on Wednesday, January 5th. We recommended meeting dates for uh, January up until um, the May election, or the, the organizational meeting thereafter, with dates as follows. Uh, Mondays in January, the 10th and the 24th, with the 17th being the Martin Luther, Martin Luther King. The King holiday. For February, we recommended February 7th and 28th, with the 14th being Valentine's Day and the 21st being President's Day. That's not school vacation week, no. No, it's the 21st, Mrs. Duda. I remember all the girls' school vacation. Well, Mike's right there with you, so. We <laughs> live in the same schedule. <laughs> um, we then recommended for March the 14th and 28th. Again, as, as, as has been the case for the past few years, we typically will recommend the, the second and fourth rather than the first and third Mondays for March and April. Um, part of that being because of the crunch of the meeting dates in February and because of the holiday in April as well. So we recommended the 14th and the 28th. What is not on here is the date for the Saturday budget hearing, which we uh, anticipate will be um, the either late February or early March, and we'll come back with that date in, in uh, either in December or early January. Except February 26th. Um, yes. School vacation. Correct. We do not typically have it. very selfish there. No, we, do, we don't typically have it that way. We, I would hardly call your volunteer service on the select board and all of the meetings that you attend selfish. I'm not Mr. Gil I, uh, Mr. Gilberto. For April. For April. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, di that's a dialogue for another time. Three Mr. Madam Gilbert. Chair, April 11th and 25th, with the 18th being Patriot's Day and the school vacation week. Mm, I know we take them out of negotiations, but the 25th is my birthday. Oh, we'll have to celebrate that. I'm <laughs> going to be expecting a cake. <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems uh, fun. Like, what page do that seems fun. Times again? Page four. In the, they're in the notes, the agenda notes. Page four. And then the May elect. When is the May the election? election? Would be uh, Tuesday, May third, and so we put out there if the board were to meet as it customarily does, which is the Wednesday thereafter, it would be May fourth. May fourth. We'll make it the fifth week over drinks after. <laughs> <laughs> Single the mile. It's always what you say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. To be fun. Okay. Anyone so have, have? Oh, Mr. Walker. Yeah, I have one. I'm going to be out of the country on January 24th. Country? Um, you want to go anywhere good? Can't do that one. Stop, stop, stop. Well, so you can always zoom in. <laughs> Rich, where are you going? I'm that from Barbados, so I'm not sure. Nice. Nice. I will be in North Carolina. It's a great wonder my whereabouts. <laughs> not okay. something. <laughs> all right. With other than that scheduling conflict, are we all set with this schedule? Are you going to be on Zoom from Barbados? Please don't. Hopefully not. Uh, I don't like that. I, <laughs> I, I hope Please not. Don't. I certainly hope not. All right. Okay. Any questions? All, all set? And then our... Okay. We're all set with that? Yes, ma'am. Mr. O'Leary, all set? Okay. <coughs> all right. Our next... Yes. Uh, order business is the town administrate. Oh, Miss, excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Gilberto. Could you please just send us an email with all with all of those dates? That I would can. just help to add it to the calendar. I Thank can. Um, Full transparency. I think you asked me to do that in the last batch. I don't think I did it. So <laughs> it's probably why it just didn't end up on my calendar. So, 
Um, all right, so t t the next order of business is, the, is Mr. Studi, you have a question? Are we going to try to start a little earlier than that, than on the 6th? So, on there, <laughs> evidently there's a significant football game <laughs> happening on December 6th. So, I th what, the, question, the question was raised by Mr. Studo. He just me? asked if we could start a little bit earlier on the 6th in the hopes that we'd be able to get out of the meeting <laughs> more quickly than we typically do here. I don't know what the game is or what the t time is or the schedule is. Um, I'm sure I'm going to watch it after the meeting, but I, we typically start at 6.30 um, and we could we maybe start the regular meeting a little bit earlier than that. Is there anything preventing us from doing that, Mr. Gilberto? I will check quickly on a schedule here, but I am not aware of anything either personally or going on here at Town Hall that would prevent Okay. That. And so would we want to start that meeting at 6? Yeah. I or Mr. Gilberto, five? <laughs> Four? <laughs> Four. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. I'm like, I'll buy lunch for everybody. <laughs> 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 I knew. I can adapt to my schedule. No, but I, same here, Madam Chair. It can be yeah. flexible. It's early or late as it would be like. I'll make you a deal. Okay. Because I Let's actually Let's happen, make a deal. I happen to work until five. Uh, so my work schedule is until five. So I let's say if we started at five, <laughs> I have to. Whatever. Would that be? Um, right, but I, I don't. Again, it was so a request, but like I don't want to. Everyone's going to agree. I we, do. We don't have a anything in our our bylaws that says this meeting has to can't start after. Okay. We have policy, but that can always be waived. And okay. Again, just adequate notice to the public. All right. For a good cause. I was just wondering about that, and and members can attend virtually anyway. Or, or, I mean, but you know, people can attend it. It'll still be virtual as well at that point too. Okay, Mr. Walner, was that? Uh, Mr. Walner, I'm good with starting early on the six. Okay, so why don't we just say we'll start at five then? And okay. anything that might need to be handled in an executive session is just going to have to lend over to the next regularly scheduled meeting. Right? Right. All right? Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> and then next order of business, town administrator's report. <clears throat> Madam Chair, through you, just a, uh, a friendly notice for those who may not know. The North Ready Food Pantry has moved to 150 Haverhill Street next to Union Congregational Church. Their donation drop-off points are the Stop and Shop and the Post Office on Park Street. They have informed the town that they can no longer pick up donations here at the town hall. So just to let folks know, if you're looking to drop off donations, they can go um, to the food pantry or to Stop and Shop or the Post Office. I attach to the board an updated listing of projects that I provided at their request to Representative Jones and Senator Tarr in anticipation of possible funding opportunities in the coming weeks and months. I updated the, uh, the list to include some additional items that have been submitted um, and they were italicized on the uh, listing. Again, I forwarded that updated list along to the Senate and the Representative. Uh, unfortunately, the current round of state co community compact funding could not accommodate our wastewater financing of green communities project requests. So we were not awarded funding at this time. However, we will continue to monitor the availability of funding between now and, uh, and whenever uh, the next opportunity comes up. Um, we did receive a favorable renewal of our retiree health insurance plans. I attached a copy of the summary um, for the renewal that we have signed off on, and it is within the uh, FY22 operating budget allocation. Um, second to last, um, I've been informed by the town clerk that she has been contacted by Northeast Metropolitan Vocational School District relative to their uh, efforts to potentially request or schedule a district-wide election, um, which uh, I think there's still some question as to their authority to, to do that from uh, conversations we've had, um, you and I, Mr. Madam Chair. 
but I know they are looking at that, and apparently they are going to make some sort of a determination on a course of action, I believe, at their, their first December meeting. I'm not sure exactly what day, whether it's the 2nd or the 9th. So I don't know, Madam Chair, I know you also wear another hat if your community has been contacted, contacted yet as well, but um, it may be if it hasn't been. Um, well, the only thing I know is that they invited member communities to a breakfast to discuss a special election, but yes. I, I wasn't part of that. Our city clerk was invited. S same here. Uh, Ms. Stats was in attendance or participated, uh, I think, virtually mm -hmm. uh, in the meeting. I was not um, asked to attend. But I know they're discussing it. I don't know that no action has been taken, but they were, I think, looking for feedback from the clerks in scheduling what would potentially be a district-wide election. So, and that, for those who don't know, is because um, it only took one community to not approve their uh, Mass School Building Authority construction project. There were a couple of communities uh, after our approval that opted not to approve the project, and that's triggered them to look at their other options. With Mr. Studo? It was in this, if a vote's taken, right, the vote is by like actual voters to vote, correct? Correct. What, well, is it then, is it like a popular vote or is it go by district? Like if North Reading says yes, is it yes because North Reading said yes? Or might break down the votes within North Reading? It's district wide, my understanding. And how many do you need to get to yes? Uh, I don't know whether it's majority or two thirds. I'd have to check that. Okay. But it's not community by community, it's district wide, the whole vote. Okay. And I know, I believe they are looking at either a Tuesday or a Saturday election. And the reason they would not potentially do the vote on a Tuesday is because of the potential impact on communities that have polling places within their schools and have not already built a calendar to accommodate that voting. We're not in that category, obviously, but there may be communities within the district that have. So I just want to let the board know, the town clerk emailed me today to let me know the status. I'm just passing that along. <clears throat> we'll continue to monitor, uh, monitor that. And then finally, um, Recreation Director Lynn Clemens has informed me of her intention to retire, uh, effective March 31st, 2022. Um, we've obviously seen some transition in the Parks and Recreation Office, um, and um, you know, we wish Ms. Mrs. Clemens well. Um, you know, she uh, uh, has a tremendous opportunity to see and uh, spend time with family, and is hoping to pursue that. And, um, certainly look forward to recognizing her um, here in front of the board uh, as that date draws closer. But I offer that just because folks should anticipate to see a job posting shortly for that position as well um, in the coming weeks. I believe that concludes my report this evening. Thank you. All right. Mr. Walner. Yeah, just, just briefly, um, I think most people know that I did that age friendly presentation at the end of uh, uh, October, and then the select board had a chance to get together for, for our first of two strategic meetings. And like in the past, this board is uh, highly favorable in supporting what the age friendly initiative is trying to do. I owe the board some homework on some of the definitions we talked about. I'm in process of doing that, I'm not done. So before I give that back to the board, um, I want to be better prepared. I don't need you to spend time fixing things that I could easily fix myself. So I'm in process of doing that. But I think the main message is the main message to the town is that um, the the age friendly initiative is strongly supported by the board, and we're going to do whatever we can to make that happen for the town and for the people who are affected. Ultimately, the whole community, but especially rising seniors and existing seniors. So um, work flows on me a little bit to get a lot of that done, and I apologize for not having it done. Uh, by this meeting tonight, but it, it is a problem. So, thank hey. you, that's it. Thanks, Mr. Walner, and also thank you for joining us remotely. You're away, but you're still here, dedicated to the get dedicated to the board and dedicated to the community. So thanks for taking the time out to join us virtually, Mr. O'Leary. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. A few things. Um, one, water wastewater again, the subcommittee continues to meet. Um, just in relation to ongoing projects in relation to the chlorination plant, which is being uh, built at 303 Main Street, that's progressing well ahead of schedule, which is a good thing, and uh, within budget. So that's a good, uh, good indication of things are heading in the right direction. As far as the wastewater, uh, our consultants have uh, been conferring with uh, MassDOT, and uh, 
kind of fully engrossed in the planning stages and trying to get ourselves to fit in uh, with their schedule and see what uh, what we have to do to comply with their requests and uh, hopefully remain on schedule with, uh, with what our plans are. So, but we're all working very hard. And uh, again, I want to acknowledge the administration and Joe Greasy and uh, Mark Clark and John Kleppel and our consultants, uh, they're doing a very good job of putting an awful lot of effort into it because again, our time frame is short. You know, we're, we're looking for an October uh, 2022 town meeting. Let's bring forth a whole host of uh, proposals to move this project forward and that's very aggressive, um, but they're meeting the challenge, so that's greatly appreciated. Um, Hillview, again, is uh, still uh, considering uh, application for uh, use of the pub. It's, uh, we're going to be meeting again believe, tomorrow, subcommittee. We're going to subcommittee uh, to consider a proposal for uh, the pub area and potentially uh, the function hall up above, but uh, there's significant challenges with the facility itself in relation to uh, getting some uh, activity particularly in the function hall, uh, but we'll have an update uh, shortly, I would expect, from the board and the community as to uh, what the future holds for that uh, facility. Uh, again, Board of Health, uh, met with them the other evening. Uh, they continue to uh, monitor uh, what's happening with COVID and the uh, Vaccination rates, uh, the clinics that they're running, and uh, the town administrator will update you as to uh, what the new clinics. I know they have one today, uh, but they have some others uh, planned in the future. The town administrator will give you those dates shortly. Uh, but again, uh, the rates are up everywhere <laughs> across the Commonwealth, across the country. So again, just the uh, everybody needs to be cognizant of uh, what's occurring, what we can do individually and collectively to. Uh, keep this uh, virus down and uh, as far as the vaccination rates here locally uh, holding pretty steady but as far as the, the younger kids now we're at 27% um, of kids uh, 5 to 11 years old this is as of last I think last Friday so 27% have already been vaccinated and it's climbing so the interest is extremely high and participation rate is high uh, so for the first dose, they had we were 27 percent, 12 to 15, uh, 75 percent have had at least one dose, uh, 70, me, yeah, 75 percent at least one dose, uh, 71 percent are fully vaccinated, uh, 16 to 19, 80 percent, these kids have had at least one dose, and 76 percent are uh, fully vaccinated, 20 to 29. 72 percent and uh, have had at least one dose but 66 percent are fully vaccinated 30 to 49 81 percent one dose 75 percent fully vaccinated 50 to 64 87 uh, percent of the community has had at least one dose and 80 percent fully vaccinated uh, 65 to 74 greater than 95 percent have had uh, at least one dose, 92% fully vaccinated, and 75 plus, greater than 95%, uh, with at least one dose and 91% fully vaccinated. So fully vaccinated here in the community, we're, we're resting at 68%, and we need to, need to do a little bit better, so uh, opportunities are being presented uh, to the community uh, through the Board of Health and some uh, vendors that we're doing business with, as well as at local CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to, to sign up. So again, 76% of the community uh, has had at least one dose, 68% fully vaccinated. So let's be vigilant, and of course, with the holiday, holidays coming up, Thanksgiving this week. Uh, just be cautious, be careful, and be smart. Do the right thing. But again, the Board of Health working hard, and. Uh, monitoring uh, activities that uh, just for informational purposes we're at uh, just in the last two weeks there's been 40 new cases and those case loads are now starting to increase and we were averaging just a little better than three three cases per day we're now 
CD5 just the last week or so. So it's, there's an uptick here. Uh, there have been uh, kids you know, less than 11 years old. I think there's been like 50 some odd cases. So just in the last week, there's been 53 new cases just in this past week. So okay, things are ticking up. It's not just here, it's everywhere. Are those broken down with vaccinated and unvaccinated? Well, some of the kids were get under under. I mean, with adult that went with people who can. Be. Yes, there there are also as far as since July first, um, there have been from July first to November twenty second, there's been four hundred one cases in the town of North Reading. Two hundred fifty unvaccinated. 151 vaccinated cases. Since July? Since July. What about just the recent one? The recent ones, I don't have the exact numbers, but the uh, public health nurse has indicated that uh, I think it's running almost two to one on vaccinated. As far as the, so the breakthroughs, well, there are breakthrough cases. The vast majority of the people um, that are contracting COVID right now are unvaccinated, which kind of makes sense. Yeah, well, it's well, different. And and Andover's, Andover's numbers are more vaccinated, so I was just curious. I'm not aware of Andover's, and then I think uh, everything that I've seen from the, uh, the national news level and even the statewide level, the uh, unvaccinated rates far exceed those that are vaccinated for the breakthrough rates. So, yeah, they're, they're just more vulnerable, you know, for whatever reason. It makes sense. Uh, but that being said, people need to be cautious, and when we're in settings, you know, Use the masks. Uh, if you're going to be uh, going out in public and going to public places, just be cautious. That's all. But anyway, they're very vigilant. And the administrator has been tuning in too, so. <laughs> just, we lost our audio. I'm here, so I need to briefly dial us back in. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Hold on. One. Okay. Does Mr. O'Leary have to say that all again? He doesn't have to say it all again. I think if you, you, I, North Cam has it, but Good, Zoom okay. did not. Yeah. For, uh, what happened. You need audio for Rich. I'm thinking though. you got more people on North Cam than Zoom right yes. now. So Maybe yet. two more people. Yeah. <laughs> one, one and a half. No. <laughs> <laughs> that includes Phil. That's his family. <laughs> That was probably in response to. Enter your participant ID. They you are so in the meeting now. There oh, right. are seven All participants. All right. In the meeting. This meeting is being recorded. You are muted. You can mute or unmute yourself by <laughs> pressing star six. You have been added to the waiting room. You cannot talk or listen until the host admits you to the meeting. You are muted. You are unmuted. Okay, we're all set. All right, Mr. Studo. So I just want to Mr. say, uh, just relay the same message that Governor Baker did that enjoy Thanksgiving, something <laughs> that we could not do last year. Um, you know, of course, be cognizant, but also understand that it's a diff it, it's different. Um, it may look the same, but I do believe it's a little different. And that's it. I'm going to end on a very high note of just saying Happy Thanksgiving to North Reading. Um, I know some are staying here, some are traveling, but uh, you know, be careful on the roads because I'm going to tell you, I think that's going to be a bigger risk than COVID on the highway this year, mm -hmm. just because of yeah, there's a lot of travelers, irrespective of gas prices. So that's it. Thanks, Thank Mr. Studo. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah. That's my We going back to you, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I know. I, I know you muted me. But that's okay. Nobody I, muted. I just had a couple of just a couple of the comments. By the way, the people, the people. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. That's I thought okay. you were finished. I'm sorry. No, I, well, I get Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. So, so for those of you on Zoom, you were fortunate you didn't get to hear what I said. So, but to finish off, um, again, so that, that's from the board re board member reports as far as what we've been involved in um, from a liaison standpoint. But from a community standpoint. And I'm not going to steal anybody else's thunder here, too. But there have been several things going on over the last week or so, which has been 
terrific, which makes this community a wonderful place to, to live and participate in. And um, First of all, our strategic plan, the first meeting we had, was terrific. I just want to say to my colleagues, um, town administrator, I, I think we, we made some significant headway. I think we found a lot of uh, common ground and clarity on some issues, and we have more work to do, but it's all in a positive light, and I think it was uh, very successful uh, to the point that we're going to have a second meeting to finish things up, but I think that's terrific. Yeah, I think it was a wonderful thing. So the community, that's a good thing. Desserts were good, too. Um, <laughs> again, someone else can talk about this, too. Uh, again, we also recognize a couple of people today, you know, the CIT good neighbor, Penny Esposito, and someone can talk about that a little bit later on, but again, well-deserved. You again, can go the, ahead. You can no, go ahead. No, no, the food pantry and what they do, and uh, Penny is an example of uh, people who just quietly yeah. step up yeah. and uh, put in a significant amount of effort and work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and today, uh, the chair and I and the town administrator had the opportunity to have the uh, Boston Post Cane Committee uh, make a presentation. Uh, to Camilla to Chara, and again, Madam Chair, you can take it from there, but it's a, uh, it, it's a wonderful thing that's, that's come to fruition again. Again, this, this tradition of the Boston Post came started back in 1908 when the Boston Post gave every community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, a gold top cane uh, to give out to the oldest citizen in the community and to you know, continue to do that. Well, several years ago, or several decades ago, the cane disappeared and uh, we haven't been able to uh, resurrect this tradition uh, until this morning. And, and again, uh, much to the credit of a uh, good friend, uh, Gloria Mastro, who has been, who was hounding us for yeah. a significant amount of time to get this on the, on the road and get going again. Uh, it, it came to fruition. Uh, the, the only sad part is, is that she's in here to enjoy it and, and see that it came to fruition, but it was through her uh, diligent efforts uh, that pushed this, uh, this committee to uh, get it done. We've got a replacement cane, and it's going to be on display again in the library, a plaque with all the future uh, recipients uh, who received it, put on the plaque. And this lovely uh, young lady that received it today got a nice pin, uh, commemorating it with some citations from uh, the committee, this board, and uh, it was a delight to, to be there. And then, um, it, Chair and Mrs. Uh, Gonzalez can talk about this more extensively than I, but the drive through Thanksgiving. That's um, great. <laughs> big pickup meal uh, that Representative Jones and Senator Ty sponsor on, a, on an annual basis was a tremendous success. And uh, Linda Jones deserves, yeah. if not all, right. most of the credit. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's a tremendous undertaking. And I know there were 150 plus meals that were uh, uh, delivered on uh, Sunday, uh, very efficient operation, and uh, the effort that goes into it is, is significant. And I know the people that came through were very appreciative, but uh, to Brad and Bruce, and particularly with the, you know, uh, I know it's greatly appreciated by people who received it, and I appreciate the opportunity to just participate. Uh, and then, last but not least, uh, not funny football team is qualified for the Super Bowl, will be playing on uh, December 12th at Gillette. Oh, no, the first. What's that? The first. The first? Yeah. Yeah. First time? Oh, no, I was going to say December 1st. Oh, December 1st? I thought it was the first. Oh, December 1st, okay. Yeah. But uh, at Gillette Stadium against Swampscott, and uh, in between, they have to beat the Pioneers from Linfield to take on, to take Turkeles and hold on to Turkeles, uh, which is a little trophy that they swap back and forth <laughs> in the Thanksgiving uh, uh, rivalry, so good luck to the Hornets uh, Thanksgiving Day, but good luck in the Super Bowl too, and uh, well deserved. And, uh, they've worked hard this year, so. But to everybody else, and to my colleagues, and administration, everybody here, uh, happy Thanksgiving, and safe, safe travels if you travel. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez. Okay. Um, so I'll talk about um, recycling. Um, I got an email today from Dan Greenberg. I don't know if he's still on there. I think he's gone now. He was here. Um, received a, with the work of Joe Parisi, um, our director of DPW, 
got a small initiative grant from the DEP in the amount of $1,250 to use towards um, waste reduction and recycling. So that was great news um, from the Baker Polito administration. Um, so that's exciting and we'll have fun thinking about how we'll use that. Um, and also still working on that pay-as-you-throw initiative that's really moving forward pretty quickly. Um, so we'll be talking more about that in the future. Um, and I wanted to just talk about the Veterans Dinner. Um, Sue Magner did a fantastic job. Um, all of those who attended, it was a great evening. It's always a, an honor to be there and to be honoring those veterans and the Tewksbury Country Club donates everything, the meals. It was, it was a really, it was a really great night. And she did, always does a great job with that. Um, and of course the Thanksgiving bags, I was gonna touch on that too. That was, that was a great day. Um, three of us were able to make it and it's always fun to do that. I enjoy that every year. Of course I enjoy the sit down <laughs> dinner more. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, they always donated also, uh, Representative Jones and, and Bruce Tarr and, and Linda. So thank you to them, because that's always a great take, and, and Linda put so much work into those bags. They were unbelievable what was in there. And yeah, the Good Neighbor Awards, um, unfortunately, used to be in person and, and a bigger, you know, it, it just felt nicer to be there and be present, but, um, now it's, uh, I haven't been able to be there for the two that they've done. So, um, but I don't know, maybe, were you, th were you there, Steve? Yeah, so uh, maybe you can touch on that? Sure. My, uh, on how they did that, because I wasn't able to attend. Yeah, I mean, it was well done by Miss uh, uh, Luckowitz. Uh, so we went to the food pantry this afternoon, <coughs> excuse me, and presented Penny Esposito, who was one of the nominees with the Good Neighbor Award. Chief Stats on behalf of the CIT presented her with um, the, um, the plaque um, that goes with it. It's a small plaque. Um, I, uh, I offered a, a uh, uh, certificate of recognition on behalf of the board um, as well for, um, for Ms. Uh, Esposito. And um, it was uh, different, um, certainly yeah. not quite the, uh, the feel of having the meal together at the senior center like we've done, but um, I, I think it was a nice uh, recognition. And we were able to catch a photograph outside in front of the sign at the food pantry as well, uh, which everyone appreciated. I will note um, that um, Mrs. McNeil's son is our next honoree um, uh, for tomorrow afternoon. Um, so we'll be presenting him uh, with uh, a uh, certificate and recognition as well. Um, I believe we decided over at the Public Safety Building we'll be doing that in recognition of his, um, his work uh, uh, a year ago now. Is it that? About, about a year ago, um, assisting somebody who was uh, in trouble in Ipswich River Park and, uh, nice. due to an injury, if I have that correctly. So I um, just want to Aww, point that out. And then we have a, a nice. few others that we'll, we'll also be recognizing in the coming weeks, and uh, we can, think, I think, update the rest of the, the board Great. once those all take place uh, at the next meeting. Great. Is that it, Eddie? Yes. Eddie. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's a really nice thing that the CIT does, mm -hmm. recognizing people in the community who have contributed and um, you know, just showing their appreciation to them. So happy that they could continue to do it even though it's not in the way that it used to be done, like a lot of things. Um, and that's it, and I just wanna wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. All right, I'm gonna be repetitive because you pretty much all touched upon everything that I wanted to, I wanted to um, talk about. Eddie also was at our town meeting though. He was doing his community service for us. And sometimes he's there with the microphone too at other meetings. So he's a good community volunteer, you know, with Mrs. McNeil's son. I wanted to also acknowledge Sue Magner that the, the dinner was excellent. Um, I was able to attend with Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez, uh, town, Mr. Gilberto. Uh, we had some interesting discussions with the representative and senator, and we also got to meet and hear the keynote speaker, who's the, the secretary for the Massachusetts um, 
Department of Veteran Services, we sat with her as well, Cheryl, Cheryl mm -hmm. Poppy, and her speech was amazing about all the things that she's carrying forward, you know, making happen for veterans, and it was really just a great an excellent evening. Um, and uh, the second thing I wanted to mention was our celebration of Mrs. Deshara today. And for those who don't know where it got its name, the Boston Post came, believe it or not. Some of us didn't know the Boston Post was a newspaper. <laughs> and so that was the genesis of the name. And also just to acknowledge Gloria Maestro's daughter, Paula was there. And Paul is on the committee, the Boston Post Kane Committee. And she and Angela Mosseri were instrumental in pulling that together. And that was another great, um, that was another great, you know, like Mr. O'Leary said, community celebration of this, you know, wonderful woman who has her, her advice was, you know, family is everything. Be, and be kind, and that's her kind of secret. To, and she's a very funny woman too, so you you could definitely her humor definitely came through. And Representative Jones was also there to convey, um, you know, a citation on behalf of the of the uh, legislature. So that was a really nice, fun thing to do today, and celebrate her and celebrate her membership in the community. And thanks to Mrs. Mosseri, and. Uh, to Paula for making that happen, Keep pulling that together, and the committee for making that happen. The other thing I wanted to um, just acknowledge again was that senior, the, the, the baskets, you know, we're, we're here doing that as members of the board, but everybody, there's a whole host of volunteers that show up and make that day happen, and that was several hours yesterday afternoon because they we're passing out baskets for Reading seniors as well as North Reading seniors. They started with Reading and we then got there a little early. early. <laughs> we got there, yeah. So, so they, we were enlisted for both. Mrs. Gonzalez and I were enlisted for both. Mr. O'Leary was there, and it's Senator Tarr, I think, and Representative Jones just make it a yeah. make it a lot more entertaining. We'll say, you know. But there was a great group of volunteers that really, there's a lot, it's like an assembly line there. So thank you to them for doing that for our seniors. And, and um, you know, it's just a, something amazing that Representative and Mrs. Jones and the Senator put together for the community. And it's, it's just a wonderful thing to see how many seniors showed up to give donations to the food pantry. Yeah. It's excellent. Um, I wanted to also mention the discussion that we had um, on the strategic planning meeting because um, it, I agree with, with um, my colleagues that it was a, an ex, we made excellent progress. And in terms of Mr. Walner's presentation with regard to the age friendly initiatives, it did yield some outcomes that we had decided as a board, which would include. Um, uh, appointing a public services director um, to uh, oversee. There's a position in the charter and that would be to oversee our public services departments. We think that would go a long way to towards some of our strategic planning goals and vision as well as definitely the commitment that we made to that, that age-friendly initiative uh, a while back. And we also uh, intend to, I believe we had discussed at that meeting, the funding mechanism for that would be, you're going to have to remind me, Mr. Gilberto, initially covering the funding for that. Do we say ARPA funds? I, or were we talking about salary reserve? Yeah, I believe it was salary reserve. Salary reserve. About. And then we'll hopefully have a person in place to help out with, and that would just go a long way towards us meeting a lot of these goals that we're trying to get accomplished. And the second piece of that is we did already fund in the budget with town meeting a grant writer, so we'd like to, you know, actually actively recruit a grant writer for the town, which would also go a long way towards those goals, and we, we have Mr. Wall pointed out to us 
during that meeting that we have made specific commitments when we signed on to that. So these are steps to take that, that will, you know, sort of go a long way to, to completing those goals on a timely basis. Even though we had COVID disrupting things, we're on, we're back on the track to completing those goals. And like Mr. Walner said, we're going to reconvene, and Mr. O'Leary said, we're going to reconvene that meeting because um, we have a lot more planning to do and some, you know, some strategic vision to, to move forward. But at least we're in a good spot with some, re some concrete results yielded. And I also wanted to mention that, that um, the North Reading Maskers is going to be putting on a production of Newsies, um, and there are tickets still available. And if you haven't seen a North Reading, North Reading Maskers production, you should go and see it. It's like a Broadway show, and you'll want to go back. So go to the earlier shows, because you're going to want to take your family back to the shows after that. So the tickets are on sale. You can go to ticketstage.com. Sh they're going to show the play December 3rd and December 4th, December 10th and December 11th. I had the occasion to attend a Wakefield production um, and I learned that our drama instructor is best friends with the Wakefield instructor so he invites her to do a showing. Um, so we, I saw a sneak peek of one of the numbers from the show and um, and they participated in the end, and that was that was excellent. The perf the performance, the Wakefield performance, is excellent too. So, but anyway, go buy your tickets to Newsies. You're going to want to bring your family. It's a great time. It'll be a fun time, and um, that's my shameless plug because I happen to have a son that's <laughs> in the show. So. Um, uh, and finally, I just want to end by j wishing everyone a. a healthy, happy, holy Thanksgiving. I hope you have a peaceful, I hope my colleagues, and I hope uh, members of the community have a, a nice, peaceful, enjoyable Thanksgiving. Do we have a motion? Yeah, there's always <laughs> a motion. Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manupelli is aye. <laughs>